story of the Pacific War and all of its horror and triumph. Uh, our topic today is the uh, critical years of 1944 and 45 which were the topic of my most recent book, The Fleet at Flood Tide. Um, my own view of this campaign, the, the Marianas campaign, is that it's the kickoff to the, to the reckoning that determines the outcome of the war, culminating in the atomic bombings of Japan. And we've just passed the 75th anniversary of those uh, terrible events. There will be an interactive component uh, to this presentation. At the end of it, you will be presented with a poll on your computer where you can vote. The first question will be, was the atomic bombing morally justified? If your answer is yes, you don't need to answer the second question. If your answer was no, you'll be asked a second question. What war strategy would have been preferable? And you will get to weigh in. And through this mechanism, perhaps we can influence the national conversation because you're a very knowledgeable audience. I'm proud to be here with you and your opinion matters. So make yourself heard. And uh, this will be broadcast through the museum's website at a later date so that you can send the link to your friends and uh, have them enjoy uh, what we're about to experience here today. The terrific lineup of speakers. I'm proud to be part of it. Uh, I'm not wearing a mask. The good news is there's very little risk of you catching COVID through my Macintosh microphone and uh, camera. So you get to see my face. <laughs> so anyway, welcome and uh, shall we begin? As I say, my first... Uh, uh, the topic of my talk is this pivotal campaign in the Marianas Islands. Operation Forager kicking off in the middle of June 1944, mere, mere days after the troops go ashore in Normandy, leaping from any we talk in the Central Pacific all the way west to the square you see at the center of this detailed map. The, the Marianas Islands are in that box at the center of the map, due south of Tokyo, you'll notice. But imagine the achievement. Barely a week after we land in Normandy, we're staging something even more difficult in the Pacific. We're leaping across a thousand miles of open ocean um, to land on a on an objective on a, on a on a amphibious objective that is distinct in a number of ways. First of all, for its size, Saipan is a massive island. It's uh, well 45 square miles much larger than these little curly cues of coral we've conquered to date. Well, Guadalcanal was fairly sizable, and of course, MacArthur's in New Guinea, which is you know, a large land mass, but Kwajalein and Anahuitak were mere curly cues of coral compared to Saipan. They were conquered by regiments. Now we're talking a multi-division operation. The second and fourth marine divisions uh, leaping over a thousand miles of open ocean with Kelly Turner's amphibious force, um, along with the Army's 27th uh, Infantry Division, Landing on an objective, Saipan, which is uh, substantial. And our story is, is multifold. We have uh, a number of things converging for the first time. We have, well, the Army's interest in staging strategic bombing operations over Japan leads uh, um, the very influential figure of Hap Arnold, General Hap Arnold, the, command, the chief of staff of the Army Air Forces, to push the White House to authorize the Navy's Central Pacific Drive. The Central Pacific Drive was placed at risk by MacArthur's ambition to go across the Southwest Pacific, New Guinea to the Philippines. And um, it was uh, Hap Arnold's very persuasive voice that convinced uh, President Roosevelt to allow Nimitz and the Marine Corps to continue the long planned Central Pacific Drive. And so, you know, constituting this force was Task Force 58, the carrier force under Admiral Mark Mitcher. We have the aforementioned Admiral Kelly Turner this world beating amphibians, we have the Marine Corps and the Army, and we also have Army Air Forces represented by the photo here at lower right, the B-29 bombers, which heretofore had not had a suitable base for the bombing of Japan. Bases in China were vulnerable to attack by Japanese infantry and could not be made secure, which is a, no small matter when you're talking about ultimately delivering atomic bombs, you need secure basing. It was considered that the Marianas offered such secure basing, Tinian, Guam, and Saipan. So here, back to our map, uh, reminding you of where we're going and how. You'll see the leap from any we talk forward, that, that last arrow here at the center of the map, June 1944. Preparatory to that, we have to take out a fairly formidable objective. Before we can leap forward to the Marianas, We've got to do something about the great Japanese Central Pacific base of Truk. 
Truk in the Caroline Islands is the major Japanese fleet base for all of their southern operations, and it's the farthest forward, it's their farthest forward forward base, a major formidable base of major air forces and naval forces assembled within a massive lagoon enclosed by the atoll at Truk. Now, it falls to Mark Mitcher's carrier striking force composed of uh, nine carriers and three task groups to uh, knock out Truk as a threat to the amphibious force as it passes to the west, as it passes north, heading west, to the north, heading west. Um, Operation Hailstone is, uh, demonstrates the, new, the newfound power of a massed force of fast aircraft carriers of the Essex and uh, the CVL classes. They are uh, assembled in three groups of three to four carriers each. And when you have carriers in this number, in this concentration, you're able no longer, you no longer are required to perform the usual hit and run operation that characterized, say, Halsey's early strikes in the Marshall Islands. When you've only got two or three carriers, you've got to hit and run, strike, then get out. And carriers are mobile, they're awfully hard to find uh, over the open ocean from you know, land based aircraft, are really hard for us to locate carriers as targets. But when you only have two of them, you do have to hit and run. When you have nine of them, you can hit and stay. So Operation Hailstone, the, the destruction of a truck as a fleet base, is our first set piece, February 1944. Spruance heads uh, south to neutralize truck and does so over a two-day period, February 16, 17, 1944, demonstrating the newfound ability of, of fast carriers with a world-beating force of S6F Hellcats and a striking arm of TBM Avengers and SB2C Helldivers to, to come and work over a, uh, a land base. And they do so in February, opening the way to crashing the gates of the uh, Japanese uh, inner sanctum. Uh, you see the dotted line at the center of this map. This was the uh, boundary of what the Japanese considered their national defense zone as of 1943. And you'll notice that uh, the, the Marianas Islands are tucked just inside the dotted line. And by crashing into this uh, area, we are entering Japan's inner defensive line for the first time. And what the, this will do a number of things. It will, uh, among other things, activate their fleet to a major fleet operation. The Marianas Turkey shoot, the Battle of the Philippine Sea ensues. It's the largest carrier engagement of the war, much larger than the Battle of Midway, and it's quite significant on its own terms. So let's see, let's go forward a couple slides to uh, our picture of uh, Raymond Spruance, Kelly Turner, and Paul Tibbetts. These are the three organizing figures for my narrative. Spruance, what can you say about Raymond Spruance? Well, much as, you know, there's a binary here, but much as people prefer the Beatles or the Rolling Stones, people will have a preference of Raymond Spruance or William F. Halsey. Spruance, uh, Nimitz is chief of staff in the, in the uh, uh, Pearl Harbor for a long period of time while Halsey was running the South Pacific Command. Spruance, you can say, uh, still waters run deep in this gentleman. Very reserved, very quiet, not outspoken, not profane, certainly very reserved. He was an intellectual in his outlook. He saw war as an intellectual challenge, and he expressed this to his wife in his correspondence. Margaret, he said, this war is interesting. It's an interesting war. And Margaret would say, what are you talking about, Raymond? It's horrible. And he goes, yes, it is horrible, but it's also very interesting. And it was because there were the innumerable complexities of wage and the type of warfare that he had to handle going into the Marianas. Kelly Turner was his amphibious chief. Turner was also, like Spruance, uh, a considerable intellectual wattage. Turner was able to keep a 200-page operation plan in his head accessible by memory and um, was able to basically see the whole complex picture unfold from the uh, bridge of his flagship, from the uh, from the arrangement of the uh, landing craft at the line of departure to each way of going in, he knew, he'd memorized and internalized the timing of the execution of very complex plans such as Operation Forager. So as, as Turner tackles the Marianas Islands, the uh, uh, CBs have their own plans to transform these islands uh, such that the B-29 forces, the 20th Air Forces, uh, are able to use them to bomb Japan, culminating with Paul Tibbetts the commander of the 509th Composite Group, bringing his group of specially modified B-29s into Tinian to begin training to stage the atomic bombings of Japan. This is America's first atomic striking force, and Tibbetts was, 
by acclamation, one of the great, best four-engine uh, pilots uh, that we had. He actually served in Europe and North Africa flying B-17s before he was assigned to uh, the Pacific. He was sent to the Pacific basically to save his career. He ran afoul of uh, his uh, superior officer in North Africa when he was ordered to carry out a bombing attack against Bizert at 6,000 feet. Bizert was a major seaport in uh, North Africa, and uh, Tibbetts' group was ordered to bomb it at 6,000 feet. He rebelled at this order, and in a briefing, dressed down a superior officer by the name of Loris Norstad. Those of you who know your Cold War history will know Loris Norstad ends up as chief of staff of the Air Force and, uh, and a major NATO commander. Um, so this was not a man to trifle with, and uh, Norstad had it in for Tibbetts, wanted to put him up for a court-martial, and it was General Doolittle who was in, who was a commander who was, uh, who saved his career by transferring him to the Pacific. So Tibbetts gets sent home to Florida, where he visited with his mother, Enola Gay Tibbetts, and uh, was eventually transferred to the B-29 forces to uh, this, this very difficult new aircraft, which had all kinds of technical problems. But uh, Tibbetts helped straighten them out, and then he took his unit, the 509th Composite Group, to Tinian Island in 1945 to begin training to drop the bombs over Japan. Next slide, please. The Fleet of Flood Tide is the title of my book. This slide gives you a sense of what that flood consisted of. The large silhouettes are the familiar sights of Essex-class fast carriers. We've got a South Dakota battleship, and we've got some Baltimore-class heavy cruisers, some Cleveland light cruisers, some destroyers, and so forth. But the real flood is highlighted in yellow at lower right. You see the number of ships commissioned in these, each of these three years, 42 to 44. Well, the flood is the flood in amphibious shipping from 42 to 44. You see these big five-figure numbers. Okay, it's well and good to commission four carriers or, you know, four battleships in 1942, two in 43, two in 44. But what about 9,000 amphibious ships in 42? And these are small. Some of these are quite small, but... Nonetheless, 21,043, 37,724 in 1944. This enables what Admiral King calls the outstanding feature of the Pacific War, which was the ability to project heavy power, heavy amphibious power, through the lift capability of this amphibious task force over long stretches of ocean, such as we were carrying out in the Central Pacific in mid-1944. Um, next slide, please. And so as the fleet assembles uh, at Majuro in the Marshall Islands in mid-44, they leave Majuro, uh, Mitcher and Spruance do, to take out Truk. And then the next uh, objective is Saipan itself. And let's go to that map. Next slide, please. You see the great leap forward, a 1,000 miles from any we talk to Saipan in June of 44 to cross oceanic conquest. Um, crossing into the inner perimeter of the, Jap the Japanese National Defense Line. Next slide, please. And we have the mighty amphibious task force of Kelly Turner landing on Saipan. Now, there are a number of innovations that he's bringing to the Central Pacific here. For one, Draper Kaufman is bringing a large cadre of underwater demolition teams uh, to Saipan. Saipan has a fringing reef. Let's let's see. Uh, let's get to our map of Saipan here. Let's jump forward uh, three slides, two slides. Let's see. I'm sorry. Where's my Saipan map? Um, oh, never mind. Let's see. <laughs> Graphics. Okay. Well, trust me, Saipan, 45 square miles with a large central peak, 1,500 foot mount, peak known as Mount Tapachau, as a fringing reef on the western beach. The eastern beach is a large bay, which the Japanese expect any attack to target the bay. And so all their weaponry is uh, targeting the bay to the east. Turner comes in from the west. The only way he's able to attack the western coast and its fringing reef is to use the underwater demolition teams to gauge the depth to set charges and blow coral heads, which will enable the Marines to land their swimming tanks. The swimming M4 tank is a great innovation that the Marines bring uh, to the Pacific. And these are able to waddle through shallow waterways and land on uh, undefended beaches. And having M4s with you is a great morale boost if you're a Marine rifleman because, you know, it's great cover from the Japanese uh, snipers and so forth, uh, which they had in great numbers on Saipan. 
So Saipan as a large objective, it's the first time, as I said, uh, that we're tackling such a large objective with multiple divisions. And a number of things happen at Saipan for the first time. We're facing a large Japanese garrison, 30,000 Japanese troops and naval, uh, naval landing troops and uh, soldiers are defending Saipan. It's got very difficult terrain. It's mountainous. It's full of crags and coral caves and basaltic lava caves. And uh, the terrain, let's see, let's go to that terrain slide here. The one after the fifth, the, the picture of the Marines entering that thick cane. Um, you can just see innumerable places for Japanese to hide. But the outstanding feature of the campaign is that for the first time anywhere in the Pacific War, we're facing a sizable objective with a civilian population present on a battlefield. Saipan is the home to some 25,000 Japanese civilians. Now, these are traders. They're the families of traders selling uh, copra, sugar, and pineapple to the home islands. And, uh, and uh, it's a robust business. But we're dealing with a uh, very challenging battlefield environment, reckoning with a large enemy garrison of troops, as well as a large uh, contingent of uh, civilians. We go in with certain assumptions about how this is going to go, and our assumptions are thwarted. This is the... Uh, revelation of Saipan, as it were, and it will bring a reckoning. Now, the Marines go ashore under considerable fire from reverse slope mortars and artillery on uh, June 15th, 1944. And this provokes, let's go to the next slide. Let's see, let's go down uh, to, the, uh, to the one that's titled Battle of the Philippine Sea. This provokes the Japanese and the person of Admiral Ozawa to launch his carrier forces in opposition to the U.S. landings. Now, Ozawa has been biding his time, waiting to see where the U.S. offensive will go. He's contending with a two-headed monster, MacArthur, advancing across New Guinea toward the Philippines, and then there's the Navy and the Marines coming through the Central Pacific. Where will he commit his strength? Well, when the Marines go ashore in Saipan, he knows what he's got to do. He sends all nine of his carriers under command of Admiral Ozawa um, to the, to the Marianas to oppose the landings. And um, what ensues is the battle of the Philippine Sea, the largest carrier engagement of the war. You've got nine Japanese carriers against 16 American midway featured four carriers per side. So you can quickly do the math and conclude that the battle of the Philippine Sea is a much larger carrier engagement than even midway although uh, its importance is maybe somewhat dwarfed by Midway, it was important nonetheless. The euphemism the uh, carrier aviators come up with for the Battle of the Philippine Sea is the Great Marianas Turkey Shoot. The, uh, the innovation of, of um, radar direction, radar-directed combat air patrols are able to discern in advance the approach of Japanese aerial formation and intercept them at altitude which is a wonderful thing if you're a fighter pilot. You no longer have to gain altitude and hover burning fuel waiting for the enemy to appear. You know where they are. You go straight at them with a full fuel tank, and you have plenty of fuel to carry out um, an air-to-air fight. And the Hellcat pilots perform legendarily here. They claim 380 air-to-air -air kills. And then we have the poor Japanese have the matter of the uh, any aircraft fire of the uh, carrier task force, you know, all kinds of battleships and cruisers flinging proximity fused uh, five inch ordnance skyward with a, you know, 30 to 50 foot kill radius detonated by radar control. These, uh, these projectiles put up a uh, torrent of steel over the task force and knock down whatever the Hellcat pilots don't manage to bring down. I think we had a couple ships take hits, but no significant damage. And the outcome of it was an absolute rout of uh, Admiral Ozawa's carrier force, the essential defanging of Japanese carrier force from having any effective offensive or defensive power, which will pay huge dividends in the subsequent campaigns in the Western Pacific, starting with uh, Peleliu and uh, Leyte Gulf. Let's see, our next slide will be uh, beautiful F6F Hellcat, number five there. Um, we talked about uh, what they did. Pilots who stood out in this campaign would be uh, Commander of Air Group 15 off USS Essex, Commander David McCampbell. Then you've got Alex Brashew, who brought down six Japanese aircraft in a single mission. 
famous photo of Verashi, which I'm sorry I don't have here, holding up six fingers with a huge smile on his face, got big play back home in the nation's papers and signaled the uh, arrival of American carrier aviation as truly a world beater. Now, uh, another feature of the campaign was our submarine force operating in uh, close, as it were, close cooperation with the surface forces. It was sort of by accident, I suppose. The Japanese, the, our, carry, our submarines were serving a scouting function, tracking the movements of Japanese ships coming up from the Celebes and the Western Pacific toward the Marianas. But uh, we have a couple of signal successes on the morning of June 19, 1944. Kavala bags the U.S. the IJN Shokaku, a big fast carrier, one of the uh, Pearl Harbor culprits, followed by the USS Albacore getting her teeth into the brand new uh, large Japanese carrier, Taiho. So unfortunately, an error in damage control uh, enabled Taiho to accumulate a whole bunch of gas fumes and uh, a spark to set her off like a firecracker and she went down very quickly. Single torpedo hit from the uh, Albacore, I believe. So those two submarines performed brilliantly and supported the campaign. And of course, we have uh, Nimit, we have uh, Spruance and Mitcher with their world-beating uh, naval aviators. The fighters do their thing, blunting the Japanese attacks. And then uh, in the fleeting hours on uh, June 19th, we send out our uh, strikers to get after the Japanese carriers. Now, the carrier admirals wanted to be unleashed completely to go west and destroy the entirety of the Japanese fleet. Spruance holds them on a leash. He declines them, declines the, requ the request to detach and steam west at high speed. Spruance earns the enmity of the carrier admirals, but he knows what his mission is. His mission is, per Nimitz, to cover and support the landings in the Marianas. Cover and support means you cannot run off. You cannot run off to the west and chase carriers, destroying the fleets well and good, but your principal objective is to cover and support Turner's operations to seize these islands. Spruance does so, and yet the carriers still get off a strike uh, late in the day, uh, late day, 3.30 p.m. sighting of the Japanese fleet, enables one strike to, to, uh, to fly off, and we manage to, uh, let's go to the next slide, please. We, we catch the Japanese fleet, and we sink uh, the IJN Hio, uh, the fast carrier, and we damage one other, but we do not accomplish the total route that the carrier commanders envisioned and hoped for. An incredibly dramatic moment proceeds as the pilots return after dark. Now, having carried out a strike at extended range, having engaged in combat, and now returning after dark, across a 400 mile distance back to the fleet, you can imagine the ordeal these pilots find themselves in. They're exhausted. They're, every one of them is almost out of fuel as they approach where they expect the US carriers to be. Many of them are wounded. Uh, Jig Dog Ramage recounts hearing, you know, people sobbing on the, uh, on the radio, you know, envisioning having to crash into the open dark ocean at night to their death. And uh, he had to turn off his radio, it got so bad. Mark Mitcher and his radio snoopers are detecting the chatter, detecting the requests for uh, location, and Mitcher makes a courageous decision. It's standard protocol for carriers to operate in a blackout condition at night. A single, a single cigarette topside can betray the location of the fleet to snooping enemy submarines, and so the blackout is an inviolate rule of nighttime carrier operations. But Mitcher gives a dramatic order for the benefit of his pilots as they're returning. He sends out the order to the whole task force uh, 58, turn on the lights. Turn on the lights means turn on every light, not just flashlights, but carbon arc searchlights, deck lights. And some of the pilots seeing this spectacular light show feel have a surge of panic that they are approaching a Japanese island. Task Force 58 destroyers, cruisers, battleships, and carriers alike sending aloft beams of light stabbing into the dark. And uh, it's a heaven sent uh, reprieve for these pilots who, alas, uh, find their home. Now, many of them make the mistake of lining up to land on destroyers because it's hard to tell a destroyer from a carrier uh, in the black of night on a black in the sea. But uh, about 75% of them manage to get home. And it's a Incredible morale boost to the U.S. Uh, uh, Naval uh, Aviation Corps to know that they are led 
by a man such as Mitcher, who takes their well-being so seriously that he will endanger his task force for their benefit. The so-called Turn on the Lights episode is one of the dramatic incident, in, in, incidents of the whole naval war in the Pacific on the U.S. side. It's a great story. and stirring indeed. So uh, back on Saipan, let's go forward a couple slides. Where are we here? Let's see. Uh, let's go forward to the little boy behind the, the, the barbed wire. Back in Saipan, we've set up uh, stockades with extensive uh, medical and food and uh, all types of support for the civilians who turn themselves in or who the Marines send back as having captured. Um, these poor people, there's 25,000 uh, you know, you know, civilians are forced to watch in horror as this enemy task force materializes off their west coast. And here come the Marines and here comes the Japanese mortars and artillery and it's a real fight. And the civilians are terrorized, the civilians in the town of Garapan on the west coast of Saipan, head to the hills. And I, um, in some of, uh, at the FDR library, I found some incredible memoirs of some uh, Japanese, of a young Japanese girl, Shizuku Miura, who witnessed all this and headed to the hills to hide out. And what that means is hiding out with the Japanese army. Now, the Japanese army has been brainwashed by their commanders to expect uh, the Americans to be absolute barbarians. Maybe it's a case of uh, projection, but um, the Japanese commanders inform their rank and file that American Marines uh, are only accepted into the Marine Corps by demonstrating their ferocity by killing their own mothers. And so that being the case, God knows what they will do to you. Do not allow yourself to be captured. And so as the Marines are overrunning Saipan, now the 4th Marine Division runs straight across the island, securing the Air, Aslito Airfield, the principal airfield in Saipan in the south of the island. The 2nd Marine Division lands and holds a pivot, as it were, on the, uh, on the shore, pivoting north uh, as, the, as the 4th Division. The 2nd Division holds the coast while the 4th Division sprints across the island. And then the, 20th, the 27th uh, Infantry Division of the Army lands in reserve and occupies a central position moving through that terrible terrain I showed you. Now, there's an awful controversy that ensued known as Smith versus Smith, this being uh, a, uh, an argument between the Marine Corps and the Army over how quickly the Army's pace of operations is pushing forward on Saipan. General Howland Matt Smith is the Corps commander in charge of all three divisions, um, and he develops a very low opinion of uh, General Ralph Smith, the commanding general of the 27th Infantry Division. He believes General Smith's men are lagging, not keeping up with the hard-charging, fast-moving 4th Marine Division. And so, you know, gaps are opening up on the, uh, on the ends of the lines, uh, and Japanese are able to infiltrate. And uh, G General Howland Mad Smith really develops a thing, uh, uh, develops kind of a grudge against the Army. I would submit to you that this was an unfair judgment. Expecting the uh, army to keep up a swift pace of advance across the central spine of Saipan over mountainous terrain filled with caves, coral and, and lava caves, where you have all kinds of Japanese troops hiding out in caves, caves need, needing sealing and dealing with flamethrowers and so forth, does not lend itself to a rapid advance. And so uh, there are some, some areas of terrain which simply could not be conquered quickly on Saipan. And so the Army paid that price, and they paid the price of Howland Mad Smith's fury. This, uh, the, the, the relief, what, what proceeds from this is uh, General Ralph Smith is relieved of command by, by uh, Howland Mad Smith, and uh, a Terrible contretemps developed between the Army and the Marine Corps, which uh, persisted for quite a while. Fortunately, uh, comity was restored in later campaigns under uh, more pliable and more collegial uh, personalities, such as uh, General Buckner and uh, General Geiger. But Howland Mad Smith really stirred it up by relieving General Ralph Smith at Saipan and created a lot of ill will between the two services, Army and Marine Corps. Now, the horror of Saipan has to do with the behavior of the civilians on Saipan. They're hiding out. Next slide, please. Let's show these northern cliffs. This is the northern tip of Saipan, these great cliffs, the Marpee Point Cliffs, 200-foot straight drop. 
and Marine squads and uh, platoons and companies reached this uh, objective the first week of July and watch in horror as Japanese mothers fling themselves off these cliffs along with their children, preferring that end to capture by these barbaric Americans. And uh, Japanese speakers are brought forward with bullhorns to beg and plead with the Japanese to surrender. They're promised medical care, they're promised um, water, but it's to no good, to no use. The Japanese are terrified of the Americans and the civilian suicides of Marpy Point are one of the notorious incidents of the war. And uh, around the same time, next slide please, we have a high level um, delegation of commanders visiting Saipan. We have General Hallamad Smith standing with a rifle. Seated to his uh, left are, well, we have Nimitz, Ad, uh, Admiral Nimitz and then Admiral King. They're giving a tour of the combat front. This Jeep is uh, you know, going all on the combat front on Saipan, um, exposed to sniper fire. They're escorted by a pick squad of Marine riflemen to keep them safe. What they witness makes an impression. Um, it's my contention that this visit by the top commanders to Saipan is the reckoning of, of the, its um, revelation and reckoning is the title of my talk. The reckoning is that the high level Pacific commanders witness directly the horrors of Marpy Point. They hear about the civilian suicides. They learn what Japanese civilians are willing to do um, on a battlefield. They will cooperate with the Japanese army. They will take their own lives along with suicidal Japanese troops. They will strap explosives to their bodies and rush American positions. And this is a taste, as it were, of what we might expect when we land in, in Japan proper. Again, it's our first experience of civilians in the battlefield, and the civilians are as fanatical, it seems, as the troops. So the consequences of this, let's go to the next slide of text. So a major strategy confab takes place between the combined chiefs of staff up, uh, well, first we have MacArthur, uh, visiting with President Roosevelt in Hawaii, followed up by uh, the president writes MacArthur afterward. You've been doing a really magnificent job against what were great casualties given us by climate difficulties, given us by climate and by certain human animals. That's a rough language coming from a Democratic president. And it's my contention that this has a uh, an impact on the attitude of the American High Command toward the Japanese opponent. Next slide, please. Is uh, uh, There's a major, uh, as I indicated, there's a major strategy meeting at Quebec City between the combined chiefs of staff of the British and American high commands. Um, King attends. And following this, there's a allied press communique. This is official government language. Read it. In a very short space of time, they reached a decision on all points, both with regard to the terminate, the completion of the war in Europe, now reaching its final stages, and the destruction of the barbarians of the Pacific. The barbarians of the Pacific in, the, in an official press communique. This is a signal that Japanese conduct on Saipan has reached, has impressed the highest level in Washington. And what follows is truly, truly terrifying. Plans for the invasion of Saipan are outlined in our next slide, please. Let's advance to uh, this blue slide showing Operation Cornet, or Operation Olympic, followed by Cornet. Operation Downfall is the code name for the uh, final invasion of Japan. For those of you who haven't read it, I highly commend you Richard Frank's wonderful book, Downfall. It is the best book about the final year of the war, about the reckoning of American commanders with the prospect of an invasion of Japan and with the conduct of the Japanese high command during that final critical year, most notably the summer of 1945 when it was clear to one and all that the fall of Saipan portended the end. Any rational military commander could see what that meant for Japan, and it in fact meant the fall of the Tojo government. Tojo is sacked as, uh, as prime minister following the loss of Saipan, and he's replaced with a dithera, uh, well, Suzuki and then Kuiso. And uh, the great tragedy of the Pacific War at this point is that even though it's clear to one and all analysts that the war is over, Look at what the loss of the Marianas does to their strategic position. They can no longer access, for the loss of uh, Saipan, the Japanese can no longer access uh, the raw materials in the southern regions, namely Malaya, Indonesia, and so forth. There, the blockade, the stranglehold around Japan is put into place by submarines 
by surface ships by naval air forces. And so here you see the massive plan for what will uh, finally subdue Japan, landing uh, 14 divisions of the U.S. 6th Army staging um, in the Philippines, uh, landing in Kyushu. Estimated kickoff date for this would be November 1st, 1945. Following this is uh, Operation Cornet, bringing 25 Army and Marine divisions into the island of Honshu, the central island of the Tokyo Plain. Next slide, please. Let's see our CBs in action here. Back on Saipan, Tinian, and Guam, the conquest of these three islands carried out in succession. Um, once Saipan falls, uh, the second and fourth Marine divisions hop over to, Sa to Tinian, covered by artillery emplaced on the southern southern um, area of Saipan. It's so close; it's a mere miles from uh, to the south of Saipan. Tinian is a flat tabletop island. It falls in a week with a very light loss of life, and uh, the, we have the first combat use of air, airdropped napalm by uh, U.S. Army Air Forces uh, operating from Saipan, P-47s flying from Saipan, bombing Japanese troop positions, formidable uh, shore bombardment by battleships and cruisers, and um, a very quick conquest. Now the Seabees go about doing what they do best, working with Army aviation engineers. They bulldoze massive airstrips on the north area of Tinian, the southern area of Saipan, and Guam as well. And our, our capacities in this regard are unmatched. And uh, once we have, you know, the Japanese did manage some air attacks and bombing attacks staged from Iwo Jima against the new aerodromes in Saipan. They did burn out some B-29s. But once, this, once these aerodromes are completed, uh, the offensive operations kick in. And by Thanksgiving Day on uh, 1944, we have, uh, next slide please, we have major B-29 strikes staging from Saipan against Japan. Now, General Haywood Hansel is the uh, commander of the 21st uh, Bomber Command, which is based in the Marianas, subsidiary group of the 20th Air Force. And the initial strategy is to carry a high-level bombing of Japan. It doesn't work, though, because the... Uh, the winds over Japan are hurricane force at a high altitude. And it's almost impossible not only to drop bombs up there, but even to fly. And so the B-29s had an awful time bombing their targets accurately from high altitude. And so what Curtis LeMay decides is that we have to bomb at low altitude. And moreover, given the nature of the Japanese targets, um, the cities are made of wood. Um, the best weapon to use is the incendiary bomb, a fire bomb. We literally burn these major Japanese cities out from the core. Nagoya, you know, one after another, Osaka, Tokyo, they burn with through conventional bombing. The uh, March 1945 bombing of Tokyo killed some 80 to 100,000 people in a series of hurricane level firestorms that kicked off once the flames started, you know, sucking in air. And uh, it's a true holocaust. <clears throat> so let's go to the next slide showing an aerial view of the incendiary bombing. So from about 2,000 feet, these, you know, 500-pound clusters scatter 38 metal tubes filled with incendiary uh, gel. Little six-pounders about 20 inches long. These cheesecloth sacks filled with jellied uh, gasoline hit the ground, and the ejection charge shoots them into the air. And these 1,000-degree fires burned for 6 to 10 minutes and are impossible to extinguish by any means. And so, meanwhile, Truman in Potsdam is demanding unconditional surrender, July 1945. And his principal objective, by the way, in going to Germany to meet with his fellow, uh, with Stalin and with Churchill, is to coax Stalin to enter the war against Japan. He wants help. He wants to end the war as quickly as possible. This is Truman's motive. His principal objective in Germany at this high-level conference is to coax the Russians to join the Pacific War. And if we go to our next slide, Let's go down two slides to Hirohito with his, his uh, war council. 
Now, this is tragic. The reason Japan, people say, well, Japan was ready to surrender. Japan was ready to surrender. Well, who is Japan? Tell me who you mean by Japan. Do you mean Hirohito? You mean the gentleman shown in this photo? I submit that you have to consider the men, the men shown in this photo because their opinion, their verdict is the one that counts. And, and you know, you can try to any number of Japanese commanders who will say, yeah, we knew it was all over after Saipan fell. And that would be the conclusion of rational minds. But what you see here are not rational minds. What you see here are complete bitter enders who believe that honor requires the Japanese nation to burn and die as a penalty of defeat in war. They believe uh, that even as bad as the war situation is, that they are not yet beaten, that there's still the opportunity to seize one last victory that will compel the uh, allies to the table, where Japan can insist on a number of conditions that it will uh, hold for the surrender before they agree to surrender. One is, everyone knows, well, they wanted to keep the emperor. They also were insisting on no occupation, and that any, any war crimes tribunals and any um, demilitarization process will be governed not by Americans or allies, but by Japanese officials. And these terms were a complete non-starter to the, to the Americans. And so uh, the people you see here, you know, they're deadlocked. Three of them, General Umezu, General Anami, and Admiral Toyota, the former commander-in-chief of the combined fleet, are absolute bitter enders. You know, these are our conditions. We will not accept the Potsdam terms. And so we, we, you've got a deadlock. Hey, Jim. Jim? Yes. Um, yes. How long is the, the presentation? Oh, I can wrap in 10 minutes. Okay, because the... Maybe five. The, I know we're getting along here. Yeah. Yeah, it's just that the actual presentation is supposed to be about 30 minutes long. Yes. Yes, I'm sorry. Yeah, because we're going okay, so to... Let's go to uh, uh, the picture of uh, the uh, propaganda leaflet here. Okay, and then yeah, just keep going. But yeah. once I do the final video, I will probably um, show it to you and make sure I didn't, you know, there's something that we might have to take out. Um, okay. but just, yeah, go ahead. A feverish effort is underway to persuade the Japanese to surrender. Leaflets by the thousands have dropped over their island garrisons and over the home islands, trying to persuade them that the emperor and their war leadership is leading them to doom. And I suppose this will be the case. The next slide, you see the B-29s and the atomic bombing, uh, the atomic bomb image. Uh, there, is a, there are plans underfoot in the New Mexico desert to unleash a new type of bomb over Japan. There is no hesitancy on the part of the American leadership to use it. The, the goal has got to be to end the war as quickly as possible. And with the deadlock that's present at the Japanese War Council at the highest level, there is no hope short of this bomb to compel a surrender. The firebombing of Japan by conventional means has made no impression on the Japanese war leadership. There is opinion uh, in the War Council is unmoved by what happens in Tokyo in March of 1945. And so we have uh, Tibbets and the atomic bombing of Japan. On October, August 6, 1945, the B-29 known as the Enola Gay leaves Tinian with Paul Timmets at the uh, yoke and carries out the little boy bombing of Hiroshima. Now, some people say, well, we should have carried out a demonstration bombing. We shouldn't have hit a city. We should have bombed a, a military objective. Well, Hiroshima was arguably a military objective. But moreover, it was also a sort of demonstration. And it's interesting to note that even after Hiroshima, Japan does not surrender on August 7th or August 8th. So from this, we can conclude that a demonstration would have had if we'd blown up some, some little meaningless atoll off of Japan or an island, some uninhabited island, would have made no impression upon the Japanese. It's only after August 9th and the bombing of Nagasaki that the Japanese War Council is moved to surrender. And that only happens because Edward Hirohito himself, citing the use of the America, by the Americans of two atomic bombs, compels his uh, advisors to vote to, to accept the Potsdam terms and cease fighting. Here Hito gives an oration to these gentlemen. Tears are shed among these hard men. And, on, and deep in the night on August 9th, they agree that Potsdam will be accepted. And on August, even, even afterward, you know, here Hito gives a national radio address on August 14th, where he announces 
this decision. And um, even after this broadcast is recorded, a coup attempt is staged that results in some killings at the Imperial Palace as some uh, rebels under General Anami, that famous bitter ender, uh, they want to seize the recording and prevent it from being issued. Alas, they fail, and Anami is forced to do the honorable thing and takes his own life. So the order goes forth to uh, surrender, and at once, let's go back to this last uh, map, Pacific Ocean, the blue slide of Coronet and Olympic. The great plan of conquest becomes a great humanitarian effort to bring home American POWs from their prison camps, Operation Magic Carpet, and along the way, we deliver Japanese soldiers home from their Pacific garrisons and also from Manchuria. So this mission of conquest becomes a mission of mercy. And what commences then is the rebuilding of Japan. Next slide, please. The final importance of the atomic bomb. Some people actually claim the atomic bombs had no impact on the Japanese decision to surrender. And then that is belied completely by the substance of the Imperial Rescript of, of August 14th. Hirohito specifically refers to the bombs as being a monstrous new weapon that forces Japan to do the humane thing and save humanity by ceasing fighting. And so... The 11th Airborne Division goes into Atsugi, and the occupation of Japan commences. Let's go to the final slide. Uh, what is stunning is that, you know, the invasion force becomes the occupation force. And so as we go into Japan, we find the Japanese, even with Hirohito, retained as nominal leader under the Supreme Commander of Allied Powers, MacArthur. MacArthur is essentially over the emperor. And what's stunning to the Americans is how completely and how, how completely the Japanese give way to the American will. They're compliant. They're even courteous. They, you know, not only do they don't resist, but they cooperate. And so thus ends our war. And so you've all been given my poll. Was the bombing of Japan moral? What is the preferred, if not, what is the better strategy? Please consider answering the poll questions and submit, uh, submit your answers, and we'll be interested to see what you all think. Thank you for your time, and this is the end of my presentation.